Developers are so excited about building applications with large language models like GBT4 because even a small team can build a powerful solution quickly. I'm going to show you how a simple call to OpenAI's API can be a foundational capability for automating many complex, tedious workflows in your company. Let's get into it. Prolego has developed AI strategies and solutions for some of the world's largest and most successful companies. This video is part two on our episode on automated document processing. I'm going to show you how to install the software using the examples, and we're going to do a technical deep dive with Prolego's engineering team. Start with part one to understand what it can do from a business perspective. Of course, everything is linked down in the show notes. To run the software locally, you need to first install it in your local environments, which you can see under the Quick Start installation. Just copy this code to install the base NeoSophia code, and then modify your local environment with your OpenAPI key. I'm actually going to jump to directly running the software. That starts with checking out the release. I'm not actually going to take that step because I'm working off a branch that I know that works, so I'm going to jump right into running the code which you will see is pretty easy. And it takes a moment to spin up just because OpenAI's API is currently processing the first document. We just need to cut and paste it into a browser and boom, there you go. Let me spread this out a little bit for you and you can see the solution that I covered in the first video. I suggest taking a few minutes to try different instructions and templates to see how the results change. You just need to modify the prompt underscore instruction txt file or the basis underscore template txt files in the code. You need to restart the application each time you make changes to these files, and I will discuss ways to work around this constraint with Prolego's engineers in a moment. Let's now talk with the team that built this demo, and we'll talk about ways to possibly extend it for your environment. So when we talked about scoping out this uh, sprint a couple of weeks ago, the the problem I described was one where you have um, a set of business users such as lawyers who need to uh, extract a certain section from a large block of text and they need to review and edit it based on some sort of parameters that they would typically use. I mean, an example might be if that a legal team gets a lot of NDAs every month that they have to process and they have specific terms in the NDAs, they may want to find a section on, you know, liability or, you know, or whatever it is and change it to their standard language to reduce any legal risk. And so we decided, uh, because we don't have like hundreds of contracts available, we decided to start with the SEC filings, the 10Q public filings from public companies. And uh, you guys found this uh, scintillating section in the 10Q filing called the basis of presentation, um, mm -hmm. which makes for some fantastic reading for everyone. Of course, I'm being facetious. And so this solution you guys built is one that would go through and could find the right section inside the, find the basis of presentation and then suggest a modification to it based on a particular template. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it looks like the majority of the code is in this file right here, this generate 10 Q basis um, Python. Excellent. Okay. So help me understand from, how did you how did you start processing all these ten Qs? Because uh, I didn't see that in this file here. Yeah, so kind of for a different project, we had some code that would let us download the ten Qs from the SEC API, and then we converted them. Um, we extracted the the text or converted the HTML to text, and then generated a uh, hugging face data set. Okay, and um, there isn't really anything super special about that. It's just a nice way to sort of store a, a column oriented data set, like where you have like a whole list of records that you can kind of query and filter quickly. Um, so we had we had that data set ready. And then for this project, we, we just wrote a little bit of code that iterates over that um, data set and uses some heuristics to, to search the text for that, that relevant. Okay, great. Reason. So then, uh, so for the purposes of the people looking at this, the code that actually, you know, downloads, parses through 10 queues and finds the right section. That's not in this library, correct? Right, right. right. We we just included the result of running our heuristics and kind of pre-generating this. Okay. So the pre-processing isn't there. So we're really just focusing on the, the LM part of it here. And our, where our that... heuristics are still there. So you can you can look at them if, oh, if you'd like okay. to see how we how we extracted. They're very they're very rough 
though. So got it. Okay. Um, all right. So then let's just get into the code here. Um, so where do you want to begin at the top of the file or do you want to jump down and follow? what's the best way to start? Well, let's just probably just start on line 32. Yeah. 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 So th this was that's, kind that's of what how, I was talking about. Yeah. So this is how we extracted the, um, the ten the basis of presentation paragraphs. Basically, this 10Q data is already in sections. So we're able to kind of filter the sections to find kind of matching text. Um and then and then just kind of split the paragraphs apart and kind of join relevant paragraphs to come up with um, that basis of presentation. And this seemed to work pretty reliably. So that's what this code is here that just kind of goes yeah. through and splits it up. Okay, great. The thing at the end is just generating a unique ID for each one based on the um the 10K that it came from. So if we wanted to trace back and find where that basis presentation came from, we could. Excellent. Um, okay, should I jump up to the top then? Is that... mm -hmm. Okay. Now this really is the, in terms of like the, the, the primary interface with OpenAI, this is almost, this is it, right? Yeah. This is so freaking cool. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Just ex <laughs> tell me what's going on here. I, I mean, I think I get it just by reading the code, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, so just given a, uh, a template that the user can define, we also give it the input text, which is our basis of presentation, and then just simply ask the LLM to match uh, that context to conform to whatever template it's given. Mm -hmm. And those instructions are in the base prompt argument that's being passed. Yeah. In. So you can think of it as like the base prompt is saying something like rewrite the the input to match the template. And then we say, here's the template and here's the input. And then that goes to the OpenAI API and the result that comes back is the answer and that's it. Okay, so for the purposes of like how we did the demonstration, the base prompt is the instructions, is that right? And then mm -hmm. context, that's gonna be the original. Yep. And, then, and then template is the template, obviously. Um, okay, so I guess this is a generalized way to make this kind of solution in any environment. I mean, I think those are probably the three building blocks, at least how I would think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but they, it, this is obviously extendable, however the, the person wants to do it. Um, I, what are the gotchas here? Is it the context window with an open AI? Is that what you have to watch out for in terms of the length that you can, you can pass in the prompt? Um, I think None of the basis of presentations were that long that we had to worry about that. Okay. But somebody wants to throw their high school term paper in there and rewrite it, they might, they're going to run into that, right? Okay, yeah. So we don't have any error checking here for that, obviously. I think one gotcha that you have to watch out for when you're doing something like this is that these models understand a lot of things themselves, which can be either good or bad. So we found that ChatGPT knew what a basis of presentation is. Like we could ask it questions about right. that and, <clears throat> and it could give reasonable answers. So something just to watch out for is that you know, if you're asking it to do this thing, it might be able to understand the task, so to speak, and sort of bring its own knowledge to bear on the situation, which may or may not be what you want in a task like this. Yeah, I could see that really happening if the LLM is trained on like a set of, I don't know, just take contracts examples. And if there's like net payment terms, like net 60 next to that are really common, it might just default to that or make an assumption based on what it sees. And if your if your contractual arrangement is completely different, then it might just give you you'd have that's might have to overcome basically the knowledge that's embedded in there. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that, but obviously, yeah, very business context um, specific. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, great. And then is the rest of it just a matter about displaying the information and interfacing? Mm -hmm. um, so this is. This is pretty wild. So really, this battle is won and lost and processing the document and building the API to open AI. And really, that's it. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, this is um, that's why this is so exciting. It's such a, a great foundation to building more complex things. All right. So let me then jump into a couple of other questions I had um, about the um, doing this, this, this kind of solution. Um, so I found that it ran pretty slow um, and that it, I'm assuming that it's, is that just the latency of calling open AI's API? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Latency and the actual computation time on the open AI. So a combination of yeah. communication to and from open AI, and then it does actually take time to calculate there. I'd say the communication time is probably the lesser of those two. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I guess switching, I mean, the 
one way to make it faster is just go with a different LLM or optimize at a smaller model. Um, okay. Or wait for uh, open AI to go faster. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and I, and obviously in this solution, you could pre-pro you could batch process everything in advance, right? The way we found out in the lightness solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all right. So then, uh, n then the next question I have is, uh, I had to restart the application whenever I changed the instructions and the template on the fly. Um, so, um, how are there ways that you could uh, you could sort of automatically run it um, so that, um, like, I, here, here's an example. If I wanted to go with a different template, I could have a drop down of templates or just have another interface where I could modify the template. Is that possible? Yep. Yeah, a drop down of templates is a good idea. Actually, if you have different ones that you're uh, kind of constantly switching between that okay. you can also edit within a little text box here. I guess, but then obviously if the ability to change templates on the fly would not allow you to pre-process everything unless you had some sort of complex, you know, back. I mean, I know you, you try to get some complex workflow at that point. So you're probably, for all practical purposes, you're looking at a choice between the flexibility of modifying the template or doing it in batch process. And I guess that's a choice you can make depending on the business problem. Yeah. Right. I, and how many I, you're looking to go through. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of a system that lets you do both though. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, it sort of pre-processes everything and you could even pre-process with a couple of different templates. And then when you're reviewing it, one, you could kind of decide, oh, do I want to manually edit this? Do I want to tweak the template to try to get it to do something that I want? You know, maybe you do that once out of every five or 10 times. So kind of combining an interactive and batch workflow, I think would might be nice. So I, I could see the two different ways we're approaching this problem. I'm thinking like MVP, get it out there into somebody's hands and iterate quickly. You're thinking like an engineer that, oh, I can make a more generalized, better solution. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. You know, the, the tension of every product team in the world. Okay. So um, last question is like, let's just say you have available training data and you have, you know, maybe, you know, hundreds or thousands of examples where let's just take the contracts. Again, we're a lawyer. I started with a contract and then they edited it and modified it at the end. How could you use that training data as a way to make the solution better? Or could you talk to me how you think about that? Yeah. So you could do a couple of things. Um, the first is to use all of the contracts that the lawyers have already edited and those are like your gold data you can use those as just examples to have chat gpt create a template from those assuming that they do have you know some correlated like standardized layout so you could go that way is that just simple as saying uh hey chat gpt here are examples before and after make a generalized template based on these is that mm -hmm. okay so mm -hmm. you could just yeah. just all right yeah. And, yep. and of course, you know, that wouldn't have to be done interactively. You could build an application that would do that for you, right? Yeah. And you could do it one of two ways. You could say, hey, here's the before and after. Here's all these examples. Now, the next one I put in, here's just the before, generate and after, similar to these. Or you could just show it the afters and say, hey, here's the structure I'm looking for. Give me a template for this. I'd been thinking about you do this one time, but you could actually have this as part of your application where it continuously takes the results and refines and improves the template. Mm -hmm. All right, I guess when you can call template engineering, let's call it a new term. Mm -hmm. that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, social, it's what social media needs. My LinkedIn feed is going to be flooded with template engineering, you know, <laughs> <laughs> listicles now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, all right, so that's one cam. I think I cut you off. Any other ideas or ways to do it? I mean, could you? why not fine tune the model? Like, I guess that's what I would have jumped out at me. Yeah, I think I probably wouldn't consider fine tuning the model without thousands or tens of thousands of examples. I think the sort of reasoning capabilities of these models is really well developed. So you'd really have to have a lot of examples of something or be trying to do something very specific to get better results doing that than just trying to uncover what's there already. So gut feeling is for most business problems, focus on just using it out of the box unless you really need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. And, and the, the thing about the fine tuning is then it just starts becoming so task specific, it can be difficult to scale in your environment. I mean, the more you can do with a base model, obviously is better. Fine tuning might make more sense if you're trying to use like a smaller, less capable open source model too. I could see that being a situation mm -hmm. where that would make more sense. But like for one of these open AI ones, like I was saying before, they already kind of know about a lot of these right. topics, they have some knowledge built in. So then I guess this gets back to our trade-off on speed. If you really want to go faster and you want flexibility, then this, you might have to fine-tune mm -hmm. like a 7 billion parameter model or something. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, and you also might want to consider how much work it would be to fine tune it versus how much gain you'd get in performance. Right. Mm -hmm. It might be better, but it might be not worth it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, guys, um, that was fantastic. I, I learn a ton every time we we talk through this stuff, and uh, I mean, really, uh, once again, I just you know, I'm just amazed at how fast you guys were able to pull this together. I think you guys built this in like less than a day. Um, clearly, my coding days are behind me. <laughs> this would have taken me a couple of weeks. So, I, I'm a, I'm officially the YouTube guy, and. <laughs> <laughs> not the code guy um someone's got to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um any final uh thoughts or pieces of advice for a product team or new developers kind of get learning this anything any wisdom you want to share to somebody just experiment and try things and see what it can do i'm i'm always amazed by the capabilities of these models they seem like magic so you know <laughs> if you have a problem just throw it at it see what it can do and and go from there you'll get learn from there. a lot yeah, and I guess um, and this is a bit off topic, but one of the things I quickly just we're just watching your your guys' behavior is that, like, you're able to do like these edge cases, complex things so fast, but that instantly gets you wanting to go down and explore even harder, more complex problems. And so the this idea that somehow these large language models are going to replace programmers, you're not going to need programs. Like, give me a freaking break! All you're going to want to do is when you can do the the hard things easier, you're going to want to do even harder stuff. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just. A, it's just a fantastic tool for the toolbox. And I guess I would encourage any product or application team at least start playing around with this because they can just do so much with so little. It's easy to build momentum quickly. Yes. When you're, when you're working you, with them. You guys have demonstrated. So um, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate the time. And uh, we'll talk to you on the next one. Sounds good. See you. Well, I hope that conversation was helpful. I learn a ton every time I talk to these guys. They built this solution in less than a day. Of course, building a solution that solves real business problems is vastly harder than building demonstration software. Just send my business partner, Russ, an email at russ at prolego.com if you're looking for some help with your AI strategy or application development.